Hello, and welcome to Day 2 of MD and DI's Focus on Fundamentals course, Keeping Your Biocompatibility Program Current in a Changing Regulatory Landscape, sponsored by Nelson Laboratories. I'm Chris Keach, and I'll be your moderator today. We have just a few brief announcements before we begin. First, this webinar is designed to be interactive. The dock of widgets at the bottom of your screen will allow, allow you to learn about today's speakers, download resources, share this webinar via social media outlets, and participate in our Q&A session that takes place at the end of our presentation. Please note that we'll try to get to as many questions as we can in the time that we have left at the end of today's program, but if we're not able to get to your question today, someone will get back to you after the program is over. Also, the slides will advance also, uh, automatically throughout the event. You may also download a copy of the slides via the resources widget. And towards the end of our webinar, we will ask you to complete our survey found on the right-hand side of your screen. Please take a moment to fill this out before leaving us today, as your feedback will provide us with valuable information on how we can improve future events. And lastly, if you're experiencing any technical problems, please click on the help widget found at the bottom of your screen or type your issue into the Q&A text area, and we will be glad to offer one-on-one -on -one assistance. And now on to today's class, Chemical Characterization and Toxicological Risk Assessment for Medical Device Biocompatibility. Discussing today's topic from Nelson Laboratories is Dr. Matthew R. Jorgensen, Chemistry and Materials Scientist, and Dr. Annalise Vertoman, Senior Study Director with Nelson Labs Europe. To learn more about our speakers, please visit the BIOS widget. It's now with great pleasure I turn this special session over to Matthew to begin. Matthew, take it away. Thanks for that introduction, Chris, and uh, welcome everyone, and you know, thank you for hopping online for this webinar. It's something that uh, I take a lot of pleasure in, you know, covering this topic. I've basically devoted my whole life to, to chemistry, and so to get a chance to uh, you know, share a little bit of this excitement with you is, is always a, a pleasure for me. So as, as Chris said, we're talking about chemical characterization and toxicological risk assessment for medical device biocompatibility. And uh, this is one of these things that over the past few years has become, you know, more and more of a focus for medical device manufacturers as they bring their, their biocompatibility uh, testing, either if it's for, for old devices that are coming up uh, to speed with the new standards or uh, new devices that are, are coming onto the market. Uh, chemistry has been a bigger and bigger part of that. Over the over the past uh, few years, and now it's uh, it's it's basically a requirement. So, uh, before we get into a lot of uh, chemistry details, I want to just take a few minutes to really motivate. You know, why should you be doing chemical characterization and, and thinking about it in the first place? One of the key reasons is, and this is something that you know is uh, it didn't always used to be the the case that when you had a new medical device that you want to bring to market and you know you're pursuing something like a, a the 510k path you really have a few options in front of you uh, to address biocompatibility for the device for that that submission and you know one way to uh, to address biocompatibility is by doing a, a suite of traditional tests that include uh, in vitro and in vivo uh, animal tests to, to cover biological endpoints or biological risks that are in, important to the FDA. And, and these endpoints are all outlined in the ISO 10993 suite of documents and in the FDA's guidance on the application of ISO 10993-1. Um, you know, now there is, uh, there's options to, to address that. One way is to do the test. Uh, another way is to evaluate the materials and processing of the device and try to come to some conclusions on the, the safety based off of a review of that material. And, uh, and chemistry is, an, is another option as well to address those risks. And, uh, and when you have these options in front of you, then you have the opportunity to really save a lot of time and money if you consider something like, like chemistry instead of those other tests. So for example, if you have uh, a medical device that permanently contacts the body, there's a whole suite of tests uh, or endpoints that are required to, to be addressed. That includes genotoxicity, subacute, subchronic toxicity, chronic toxicity, carcinogenicity. And uh, you know, I, I just you know displaying some ballpark prices for those tests on the, the slide there. Of course it, it varies. A little bit, but you can see that uh, that's quite a lot of uh, burden in testing. You compare that to uh, chemistry testing, the, the extractables and or leachables testing that we would do, 
the the price is a lot more uh, less burdensome. So uh, you know, a regular run that that we're doing right now is in the ballpark of nineteen dollars. If you go a little bit more expensive, it can get a little bit more than that, but it's still a lot less than even running just one sub sub chronic test. So it's a great way to save money using this type of strategy. Uh, another good motivation to consider it is that it also takes less time. So with the, with biocompatibility testing, if you're running something like a, a chronic toxicity test, the the timing of that is you know most strongly affected by the the biological system itself. So you can try to uh, to get things done quickly there. You know maybe you know a little bit of time can be cut off the front and the back end in terms of protocol writing and reporting, but you can't really rush this this animal. So you can see, you know, chronic toxicity testing is a you know ballpark 26 weeks. Some of these other uh, biocomp tests run just as long. Uh, chemistry, on the other hand, depending on the situation, um, you know, right now with the the current demand that we have, we're running six to eight weeks turnaround time on the test. So it's a great way to save a lot of time. And uh, in, in my experience, the the time savings for this is one of the strongest motivations. In, uh, in picking this strategy. Um, another good reason to think about it, and one that's maybe the most important to me as a, as a scientist, is that the quality of data that you get doing chemistry is just so much better than you run an animal. So, uh, you know, if you, you take something like uh, cytotoxicity testing, right, this is, uh, this is a test you know, on li living cells, that's completely pass fail. So you don't, uh, you know, either the extracts from your your medical device kill the cells, or uh, they don't, and uh, you get a binary, you know, result. And uh, if you are in the situation where you fail, then you immediately have these questions like, you know, why did I fail? What could have come from my device that, that killed these cells, and so on. And, and it's the same way with a lot of these other biocomp test. So if you do a chronic toxicity test and you fail, um, you know, after this 26 weeks and considerable expense, immediately uh, you want to address the, the issue. And, you know, the only way to get in and uh, dig into that would be to do chemistry anyway. So the, the beauty about this chemistry testing is that not only do you get answers on the, uh, the biological safety uh, according to those endpoints, but in case there is a problem, which is uh, which is rare, you know, we use uh, manufacturers are typically using really nice materials that are, are well qualified. But if there's a surprise and there's a problem, then you immediately have a, a kind of roadmap to investigate where that problem came from and and go down a path to correct it. So uh, later on in the presentation, I have an example where the, where that happened with one uh, particular project, and having those chemistry results available was uh, indispensable in tracking down and correcting the issue. So the quality of data and the amount of detail that you get um, so much better than the traditional test. I think that that's that's really great motivation as well. And um, you know, finally that. It may be that even if you choose a more traditional path where you want to do the uh, the in vitro and in vivo animal tests because it's something that uh, you're comfortable with and you've done it in the past, it may be that the uh, that the FDA or other reporting bodies will require chemistry in addition to those tests uh, anyway. So and, and this comes into play especially when there's something like special populations, uh, you know, sensitive populations. So if you have a medical device that's used in, in neonates or, or pediatrics, then there's a good chance uh, that you would need to do chemistry anyways in addition to the animal test because the FDA recognizes that, um, that you know, these animal tests aren't done or designed to be used on uh, neonate or, or infant animals. There's special concerns there that just aren't addressed by the animal. So uh, I, I think we see this coming down the line where it's uh, essentially required all the time to do chemistry testing. And you see this in the, the standards in the, the new ISO 10993-1 and also in the FDA's guidance on the application of 10993-1. Uh, chemistry is really reaching a place where it's more of a, 
a prerequisite to animal testing. So you can imagine that there's a strong motivation to, to limit the number of repetitive or unnecessary animal tests that take place. And so if we are going to do an animal test, it should be justified that it needs to happen. And doing chemistry testing with a material review is one of these ways that, uh, that if you're going to do animal tests, you could defend that. So if there was a problem that you could resolve with an animal test, then those situations. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's written all through the standards. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more, but in the new 1093-1 uh, and also the 1093-18, uh, you see that uh, chemistry has taken, uh, taken a foothold in the, the whole biocomp landscape. I think that we can expect that uh, it's, it's essentially a requirement at this point. Um, one of the things that I want to hit on here, you know, we're talking about extractables and leachables chemistry testing and, and uh, doing this in this whole uh, scheme of biocompatibility, I want to make sure that we're focusing on and, and understanding you know, where this fits in in the bigger picture of the evaluation of a metal. Because it, it really matters when you start to think about you know, what chemistry can and, and can't do and how those risks are, are balanced with everything else. So what we're referring to here is in the, in the three-step process that we go through in the evaluation of a medical device for biocompatibility, uh, where the first step is a biological evaluation plan, where you know the device is the device, how it's used, the patient contact, the, the materials, and everything are evaluated. Um, from that step, it's a certain set of tests are prescribed, and one of those tests to address biocompatibility should be should be chemistry testing. And this comes along with other uh, other types of tests and maybe some material reviews or assessments. And that's all in the second step, this testing and risk assessment phase. Um, after the chemistry testing is complete, you'll have a beautiful set of, uh, of results, you know, a bunch of CAS numbers and concentrations in, in per device units, which uh, you know is really, really exciting to me. Uh, but uh, may not be so meaningful to, to everyone. And so those chemistry results ought to be evaluated and assessed by a toxicologist to make hard conclusions about the endpoints that the chemistry is targeted for. And then finally, after this plan, the testing and risk assessment phase, there should be some overall conclusion, a biological evaluation report. And this is like the the front matter document that should be submitted to the regulatory body or the FDA, where it's like, okay, here's the device, we made a plan to evaluate its safety, we did the plan and everything passed, and then everything else, the toxicological risk assessment, chemistry testing, and other tests are kind of uh, the, the appendices of that document. So we're talking about one very important piece in the middle of this entire evaluation process, it's not uh, a, a standalone type of thing. It has to fit in the overall scheme of the other um, biocompatibility tests. And it also comes, uh, comes with a toxicological risk assessment or, or needs to come with a toxicological risk assessment in order to make the conclusion. Sorry. So the, uh, the standards that uh, we use when we're, uh, when we're talking about this, there's, there's a few of these. We put the four most important ones up on the screen. Here. ISO 10993-1, of course, is the, the overarching general document that talks about approaching the, the biocompatibility for a medical device. ISO 10993-12 covers extraction conditions and sample preparation. 10993-18, this uh, document that um, the current accepted version is, is a little bit outdated. It's, it's in review now, and uh, we, we hope to see this uh, new version out soon. Uh, that talks about the types of testing that are acceptable to, to do this evaluation. And, and finally, 10993-17 covers how those results should be assessed and interpreted from a toxicological perspective to make those conclusions. So the, the next part of our talk here, we're going to talk about how to make a, a good and meaningful extractables and leachables chemical characterization strategy. Uh, it's really important to understand that uh, not all types of chemical characterization strategies are the same. There's 
definitely they run the gamut. There's very, very poor ones and also very, very good ones. Uh, we'll be talking about what does it mean to do a very, very good one and why that should matter to you. And uh, for, for this part of the, the conversation, I'm going to turn the time over to uh, uh, Dr. Annalise uh, to talk about how to design a good chemical polymerization strategy. Thank you, Matt, and uh, hello, everybody. So as Matt explained in the coming slides, I will go over how we set up a chemical characterization study. But first, I wanted to visualize once more the purpose of a chemical characterization. So what you actually want to do is to check which chemical compounds might migrate from your device that is used in a patient into the patient. So to be able to check which of those compounds have a chance to be toxic or can be dangerous or harmful for the patient. So how are we going to design a chemical characterization? Everything starts with the sample preparation, and as Matt explained, currently this is described in ISO 10993-12. So first, you need to select your solvent you're going to use for your extraction. At the moment, it is recommended to use a polar solvent like ultra-pure water or physiological saline and a non-polar solvent. And for the chemical characterization, we use hexane instead of vegetable oil, since this oil is not compatible with the high-end analytical equipment we use for analysis of the extract. And then for the more critical devices, you would use a semipolar uh, solvent. And in the new DASH-18, it is recommended to use 40% ethanol in water to mimic blood contact. But alternatively, you also see that pure isopropanol or pure ethanol is used. So if you have selected your solvent, you need to define your extraction condition. And mostly, and a chemical characterization is done by shaking incubation of your device at 50 degrees Celsius for 72 hours. If you deviate from this condition, it can be for reasons like if you have a polymeric device and your polymer is degrading at 50 degrees, you can lower your temperature. But this needs, needs to be justified. It's also important that the chemical characterization is done on the whole device and that you extract all parts that come into direct or indirect contact with the So for example, when you have a fluid pod device, you will extract this device by filling this device and for example, circulating the extraction solvent through this device. Then you need to define um, in how much solvent you are going to extract your device. And there we see that there is a difference between how FDA or notified bodies in Europe are looking at the extraction ratios. FDA is not so strict on the ratio as defined in ISO 10912, why we have the impression that in Europe they are still requesting to use the surface area volume as specified for other biocompatibility testing, like the 3 cm square per ml or 6 cm square per ml, dependent on the thickness. But obviously, it's not always possible to use this ratio, as there is only a limited shape of extraction containers available. Sometimes there is also a limitation of the amount of devices available for your extraction, and yeah, there is a limitation in the shape of your device. But from our experience, if you have a good justification why you deviate from the extraction ratio, and when you meet your ex uh, analytical evaluation threshold, which I will explain later on in, in this presentation, it's accepted by the notified. So, and then I just wanted to note, uh, at the moment still for permanent implants, it is requested to do an exhaust extraction as explained in ISO 10 So then you have your extracts with all the chemical compounds present, and then you need to 
analyze them and identify the compact. Just to get the overview right at the moment, the sample preparation is still described in ISO 1093-12. Analysis of the extract is described in ISO 1093-18, but we are moving to a description of all chemical characterization ISO 1093-18. So, as I said, we now have our extract, and then the compounds in this extract need to be analyzed and identified. Therefore, it is really necessary that you use more than one analytical technique because you need to detect and identify the whole set of potentially hazardous compounds because when you miss a compound, this compound cannot be assessed in the following tox assessment and this could be a fatal error for patients. So I will go into more detail on the analysis of the organic compounds, as this is the, the biggest bunch of compounds uh, that might be harmful for the patient. So first, you have the whole set of compounds present in your extract, and then all those compounds need to be separated from each other, and therefore we use chromatography, which is like visualized in a picture on the slide. So here you see you have the black ink, which is a, a combination of different colors, and all those colors need to be separated from each other. Of course, for uh, these chemical compounds, we are not going to use paper, but we are going to use both gas chromatography and liquid chromatography. For the smaller molecules that evaporate easily, we will use gas chromatography, for the larger molecules that uh, are not evaporating uh, liquid chromatography. So then you will end up with a chromatogram. And um, in the old-18, it was not specified at which level you need to identify your compound. For example, you could draw the line over here on your chromatogram, and then two compounds will finally be assessed in your tox assessment. You could also say, or a CRO could say like, okay, I'm going to dry, draw the line here, and then five compounds will finally be assessed. Or you could draw the line even in the background, and then background compounds will be assessed. So there really was a need for a scientifically based evaluation of your chromatogram. And this now is described in a new ISO 1093-18 as an analytical evaluation threshold to have a scientifically based justification of the right level of detail where you are going to identify your chemical compounds. But uh, as already explained, I think yesterday by Tor and by Matt, this Dash 18 is still under evaluation. We hope to see the final version next year. So here there is a, a short definition of the analytical evaluation threshold. It is defined as the threshold at or above which a pharmaceutical development team should identify and quantify a particular extractable and or leachable and report it for potential toxicological assessment. So at the moment at Nelson Lab, we use the uh, ICHM7 guideline for pharmaceuticals to set this analytical evaluation threshold. Basically, for medical devices, uh, two thresholds are used. So for the devices with limited or prolonged exposure, you would use 120 micrograms per day. And for the permanent contact devices, you would use 1.5 micrograms per day. Um, just to remark, if no irritation or sensitization tests are performed, then it's not advised to use 100 micrograms per day, but you should lower to 5 micrograms per day, as also recommended by PQRI uh, for pharmaceuticals. And then, um, also in a new Dash 18, it is advised 
to uh, when you have uh, calculated your analytical evaluation threshold to also apply an uncertainty factor because during your chemical characterizations you use screening techniques so that means that you are going to uh, quantify your compounds based on the concentration of a known uh, standard but of course your response of your compounds on the analytical instruments are not the same compared to this analytical uh, standard and so for example um, you need to check how much your response of your compound deviates from the response of, uh, of an analytical and at the moment at Nelson Labs we mostly use an uncertainty factor of two just to illustrate it if you would end up with an analytical evaluation threshold of 120 micrograms per day then you apply this uncertainty factor, the final analytical evaluation threshold you are going to use to check which compounds you need to identify is uh, 60 micrograms per day and then convert it to micrograms per device. So the next step is you are going to identify or you need to identify all the compounds having a concentration above this analytical evaluation threshold. And therefore, we use mass spectrometry. So actually, to uh, explain it very briefly, you are going to detect and identify molecules based on how much they weigh and how they break apart. Then you end up with a mass spectrum. And this mass spectrum then needs to be compared with a library to see uh, with which other mass spectrum you can find a match. So. Um, this is a little bit visualized in the coming slides. So you above you again have your chromatogram I showed before and then um, the compound which is eluting around 12 minutes. There the mass spectrum is shown uh, below in the slide. And you're going to compare that mass spectrum with uh, mass spectra available in the library and then you would find a match. So here you see that both uh, the abundances as well as the masses of um, your uh, mass spectrum of your compound in your extract and your compound in a library match and compound can be identified as two acetyl hexanoic acids. You will also find a match with another compound but here you see this is not a reliable match as the abundances of masses do correspond to your um, masses of your compound in the extract. So this is just to explain that you need to use a library with relevant mass spectra inside. For example, we sometimes see um, mass spectra uh, of which we cannot find a good match with the commercially available uh, databases. So therefore, uh, at Nelson Labs, we have built an in-house database um, with compounds uh, composed of uh, degradation products or additives uh, of materials which are generally used to produce uh, medical devices, which will allow you to have better matches. So here you see we did not uh, this compound did not have a match with the commercial libraries but had a perfect match with our in-house library and with the crown eater which is a typical compound for polyurethane. So it's just to stress identification is really key to have a good tox assessment performed afterwards. And if you would identify your compound wrongly in your extract, this is a fatal error because you can have two conditions. Either the compound you identified has a higher chance of toxicity compared to the compound in your extract. So then you would um, conclude that you need to change the material of your device and then it takes a lot of time and money for you. But the other case is even worse in case 
your compound present in your extract actually has a higher chance of toxicity than the compound you wrongly identify, then your tox assessment will say, okay, um, all compounds in my extract are safe, and you will consider your device as safe while your device is not safe. So uh, it's really then dangerous for, to use your device in a patient. Therefore, it's important that a toxicologist know um, how your compounds are identified, which libraries were used, and how reliable the identification is. So I just listed here our statuses we are using, and only uh, compounds we report as identified compounds. We are 100% sure that the identification is correct because we have a perfect match with both the masses and the retention times because these have been confirmed by injecting an analytical standard of the compounds uh, which are generally degraded from the materials used in the production of medical devices. And here you see what it means for the different analytical techniques. So in blue, it's indicated how many compounds are detected with commercial libraries, and in green, the ones which are uniquely present in our in-house database. And there you see it's of utmost importance that you have a good library for non-volatile compounds, because we see more and more questions popping up from the authorities to have a good screening for non-volatile compounds and not only for certain polymer additives or um, certain degradation compounds, but a broad screening. And therefore, you need a library of non-volatile compounds with accurate masses, so which uh, has been developed with good analytical equipment such as an LC or BITRAP. So then now I will give the word back to uh, Matt, who then explain how these identifications can be used in a further tox assessment. Thank you, Annalise. Yeah, I, I think that's a great uh, overview, and, and I would, you know, re-emphasize that last point that, that she made as I lead into the toxicology part of this discussion, that you know, of course, when you're evaluating a set of compounds for toxicity, there's there's two things that, that are really, really important. And first is the identification of that compound. And, and sure are you that that compound is identified uh, appropriately. And uh, it takes something um, like the wealth of experience that uh, is present in Nielsen Europe with uh, decades of uh, history with, you know, these types of materials to, to recognize those that uh, are commonly present but not in these uh, these bigger commercial databases. So, so I think that it's very important. It, it leads in perfectly to what we want to uh, talk about next is, you know, once you get these chemistry results back, the, the question is most often, what does that really mean? How do I understand these results that are, that are now in front of me? And, and it, it goes back to what I was saying before is that, you know, first you have to make sure that the chemistry is done correctly. Then you need to have a qualified person take a look at that and assess and understand uh, is, are those results acceptable or not. In this phase, the, the evaluation or assessment phase, separate from the, the chemistry testing really completely, in the sense that it's, it's a separate evaluation and uh, it takes, you know, a little bit of time. It's good to sort of mentally prepare and budget the time required to do good toxicology. So, so to do that, I just want to describe the, the toxicological evaluation process as, uh, as written in ISO 10993-17, and uh, just to give an example of how these numbers are used. So uh, when we start to look at toxicology, we, we think about these types of dose response curves. So you, you typically, when you run a toxicological study, uh, you dose animals at progressively higher doses and you observe the, the response. And often it looks like this, where you have some point, uh, a point of departure, where you start to see some sort of effect, whether or not it's, it's uh, meaningful in, in the animal, until you start to see more and more serious effects, and then there the uh, animal mortality and and so on. So, 
on this slide, you can see there's one point there at uh, 10 milligrams per kilogram. This is what we call the no observed adverse effect level, or the NOEL. This is the largest concentration administered to the animal in which no adverse effect was observed. And typically, this is a figure that we use when setting uh, an acceptable threshold for a compound. Other points along this curve include the, the low well, or the lowest observed adverse effect level. So we use those sometimes, though it's a little less preferable than, than using the no well. The low well might be the, the concentration at which, uh, if it was, say, a rat study, they, there was like a little bit of abnormal weight gain or something. So it doesn't necessarily mean a, a fatal effect, but uh, an observed effect nonetheless. And of course, as you continue up the curve, you have the, the LD50. This is the, the concentration of which half of the animal population died. Of course, we want to stay very, very far away from that uh, level in, in practice because we, we don't have any mortalities as a result of the, the compounds that our device is exposing to people. So what we usually are looking for are NOELs or uh, other toxicological values based off of a NOEL, like the, the reference dose that's indicated there, it usually is taking a NOEL and then applying some sort of safety factors to make it even lower just so that we can be sure that uh, that, that concentration is acceptable. So what we really want to do is uh, understand and recognize the requirements of a toxicologist so that a suitable toxicological risk assessment can take place. And uh, this, this brings me to one of my key points. When we think about extractables and or leachables chemistry testing, uh, it's my belief that this conversation really ought to start with the toxicologist. You ought to know who your toxicologist is, what type of chemistry data are they, are they going to really need uh, to make the claims that, that you want them to make. Because you, you may find that the toxicologist might have very uh, specific specific requirements for the chemistry data in order for them to feel comfortable signing their name to, to an assessment. So I think it ought to start with the toxicologist and then end with the toxicologist for these types of assessments, because only the toxicologist can really say what, uh, what they're going to require to, to sign their, their name. So as the toxicologist goes through this process, what you'll see is that uh, we need to derive tolerable intakes and tolerable exposures per ISO 10993-17. This is the, the acceptable level. So the process for this is that uh, the, the chemistry results come in for each of those compounds that are above the AET, which is correlated to a, a threshold of toxicological concern. It needs to be determined, okay, if it's above this level, is that a problem or not? So for each of those compounds, we'll research and identify NOELs or LOELs and calculate an acceptable level based off of that. So for example, and I'll just go through this, uh, this briefly, we have and had uh, recently a medical device that had cyclohexanone detected at 3.2 milligrams per device. And uh, the question was, is that a problem or not? So to do that, we start by researching cyclohexanone on you know, using toxicological databases. So you can see here, this is uh, the, a screenshot from ToxNet, their hazardous substance uh, databank. You can, in there, there's a lot of summaries of toxicological studies on this compound, which we could use to identify a NOEL. Of course, you want to be careful that you choose good studies, you know, those, for example, that are, are peer-reviewed and uh, trustworthy. Then, to calculate a tolerable intake, to take this NOEL and divide it by some safety factors that correct for things that, uh, that, that will make the comparison more conservative. So for example, we'll take the NOEL and we'll divide it by uncertainty factor one, which is for inter-individual variation among humans, right? So not, not every human is as sensitive to compounds as the, the next person. So we typically use a factor of 10 for that to describe this variation among humans. Then what we're doing is these toxicological studies are applied in animals, and we're extrapolating that to make a conclusion in humans. Because of the difference in biochemistry between humans and animals, we add another safety factor of 10 to, to cover that, just to make sure that there aren't surprises. 
And then the final one, UF3, there isn't a standard value for this, while the other, the first two have 10. This depends on the quality of the toxicological data in the eyes of, of the toxicologist. So you can imagine if uh, all of this is being based off of a very small study, with the, you know, not very many animals, it might be that this should be a little bit higher or if the routes of administration were different. So that's typically ranging anywhere between 1 and 10. We would keep it at 1 if the, the study is very well suited to make a conclusion and increase it from there, but it isn't. Once uh, we have a, a proper PI derived, so you can see this is what it was for cyclohexanone, then we go and we want to calculate a tolerable exposure. So the TI is based on the amount per kilogram of the, the subject. The TE starts to consider the, the weight of the person that is being exposed. So to calculate the TE, we take the, the tolerable intake, multiply it by the, the weight of the, the intended population. And then we also use a, a utilization factor in this calculation to account for the possibility that a person could be exposed to this compound from several sources at the same time. Uh, it's, it's assumed in general that there could be five sources at the same time. So to get the TE, we essentially divide that by five or, or multiply it by 0 0.2. So in the case of cyclohexanone, for an adult, this would come out to be 14 milligrams per day. And then to decide finally if safe or not, we compare the amount of cyclohexanone that came from the device with the amount that we said would be safe. See that in this case, margin of safety is 4.3. That means that an acceptable level was 4.3 times higher than what was found in the, the device. Therefore, this, uh, this compound is in. So just to give you a quick example of this um, practice, we had, you know, recently uh, an enteral feeding tube set. So this is uh, designed to administer nourishment to uh, underweight uh, uh, babies. And the sponsor was seeking 510K approval from the FDA. They had done all of their required biocompatibility testing per ISO 10993-1 uh, using the traditional route with the animal test. Uh, but they uh, got a response back from the FDA that uh, even though they had passed all those tests, the FDA still wanted to see chemistry tests. So, uh, and their reason for that was because these animal tests aren't really targeted to that. So we designed a test plan that included the range of materials possible on the, you know, from the device. We extracted fluid path, and, and we even did a couple of iterations where we did an extractable study at an elevated temperature and extended time, and then later followed up with a leachable study and ultimately, the conclusion was that uh, there were 27 compounds found across the different sets of materials. Some compounds were found in multiple materials. And ultimately, 15 of those compounds were clearly above the AET and needed to be uh, assessed. Of those that were assessed, there was one compound that uh, turned out to actually be unsafe uh, for this sensitive population. So the the conclusion there is that, you know, while the, the FDA sometimes gets a hard time for being very strict and, and conservative, in this case, the FDA was truly right. So doing chemistry really protected this vulnerable population because we caught a compound that was safe for underweight neonates. And then two, since we knew what that compound was, the device manufacturer was able to go back to their supplier and say, okay, look, this compound that we found is a problem for us. It's keeping our device from going to market. What can we do to fix this? And they were able to figure out that that compound came from the black rubber gasket syringe uh, in this delivery system. So the supplier of the black rubber gasket was able to tweak their formulation, reduce the amount of this compound. We tested it again, and it was at a safe level. So it just goes to show that you know the FDA is you know really making a lot of sense by being being conservative we were able to protect the patient safety safeguard that and uh, because we did chemistry we knew what the problem was and it gave them a path to go ahead and, and fix that so just to you know tie this all together uh, that's how this fits into the big picture of biocompatibility remember that extractables and leachables chemistry testing is one part of this 
that goes hand in hand with other forms of testing and evaluation that all together provide uh, a very conservative and broad look at the, the risk of a device in order to protect uh, patient safety. So, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and, and finish up. Uh, but before I do, I want to mention the, the presentation that's coming tomorrow. This, uh, this webinar will be provided by um, Audrey Turley. She's a, a world-class expert in, in biocompatibility, and she's going to talk about how there's a lot of regulatory changes happening right now and what you can do to address those regulatory changes to make sure that everything that you have on the market and that you're going to bring to the market is in line, even though this landscape is changing very rapidly. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and stop. And uh, I think that we've collected some of your questions that uh, Annalise and I would be more than happy to answer in the remaining time that we have. So uh, with that, uh, Chris, I will turn the time back over to you. All right, thank you, Matt, and thank you, Annalise, for a great presentation. And now, before we begin with today's Q&A, please direct your attention to our webinar survey available on the right-hand side of the presentation window. If you close the survey, you can reopen the widget by clicking on the icon along the bottom of your screen. Thank you in advance for filling out the feedback form. Your participation in this survey allows us to better serve you. We're going to now move on to the question and answer portion of our event. As a reminder, to participate in our Q&A, just type your question into the text box located to the right of the presentation window or click on the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. And if we're not able to get to your question today, uh, we will get back to you after the program is over. So let's get started with our first question. First question here, I'll throw it out to either one of you. Um, how do you address uh, each biocompatibility endpoint based on the toxicological risk assessment? Uh, based on the standard toxicological risk assessment, only, uh, it can only be used to address the systemic uh, tox endpoint. Yeah, so this is Matt. I think that that's a great question, and a lot of people ask that question, so I, I think it's uh, on everybody's mind. So what we do is it, it's true that, that extractables and leachables chemistry testing right now for the FDA can only be used to address systemic type toxicity. So if you look at the, at the table in ISO 10993-1, there's actually several uh, systemic toxicities listed there. So there's there's the acute systemic, there's subacute, subchronic, genotoxicity, chronic, carcinogenicity are all systemic toxicities that can be used, uh, that, that chemistry can be used to address with the toxicological risk assessment. And uh, in the process of this risk assessment, we have all of those endpoints in mind, and those can be specifically addressed either by referencing separate uh, toxicological studies in defense of that endpoint, or what happens more often is that some endpoints like chronic toxicity or genotoxicity are known to be by far the most sensitive and will make an argument that says something like, okay, if this compound is safe enough or, or low enough that it's not causing genotoxicity, then we can also conclude that it wouldn't cause acute or subacute subchronic toxicity. So, so that's typically the approach that we would use. All right, thank you, Matt. Another question here that says, uh, how do you determine if exhaustive extraction is needed or not? So this is Annalise. Um, thank you for this question. So exhaustive extraction conditions, they are explained also in ISO 1093-12. And I can answer this very briefly. It's actually now recommended for permanent implants, so uh, for uh, implants or devices which have a permanent contact time with the patient. So, And it's also explained in a dash 12 how you do it, but actually you need to define um, the conditions, so the time you need to extract um, to ensure that you capture all of your uh, extract. All right, thank you, Annalise. Uh, another question here says, when do I use uh, leachable or extractables? Yeah, that, that's a great question because we use this term extractables and leachables uh, all the time and uh, it can be a little bit confusing which one are we really talking about. So uh, just to be absolutely clear, uh, it, it depends a little bit on the regulatory body that's being submitted to, but speaking uh, to the FDA, if you're going to submit to the FDA, they require an, at least an extractable study be attempted 
all the time. So even if uh, even if you know that there's going to be a problem at extractable temperature and, and time length, so if the device is going to have our time at 50 degrees C, you still need to attempt and demonstrate that uh, that the device couldn't withstand those those conditions. And only after you've attempted it, an extractable study can you take the next step and do a, a leachable study, which in this case means using conditions more representative of, of clinical use. So that would be 37 degrees C most likely and uh, for a shorter duration like hours. Um, so short answer, you should always do an exhaustive uh, an exaggerated extraction and uh, if that doesn't work, then you can uh, go on to leach. All right, thank you, Matt. Another question here says, what if there are a lot of unidentified chemicals in the LE result? How do you, how do, you do the risk assessment on those? So this is Annalise. Um, so unidentified compounds in a chemical characterization, of course, you do not want to have this. So there are solutions for it, and that's to um, check your extracts again, but then using other analytical instruments which will allow you to identify the compounds. So without an identification, a toxicologist cannot do anything. So um, then it's advised to try to identify this compound, especially when you find it in a high concentration. All right, thank you, Annalise. Our next question here says, is replicate testing required for ENL testing? That's that's a great question as well. We we get that uh, all the time. So the the way that we currently approach this is that to reach the sensitivities needed for a toxicological risk assessment, to get the per device results down below the AET, we often need to pool several devices together in a single extract. What that means is that if you try to do replicate testing, say across several pools of, uh, of devices, the statistics, the statistics there kind of wash out because you're already, you know, several of them. So in our experience, the, the short answer is no, it's not required to do replicate testing. And often this is because we're, we're looking at pools of devices in the first place. Certainly if there's a problem, it might make sense to go back and do some rep replicate testing to see if it was related to a specific lot or something like that, but generally not required. All right, thank you, Matt. Another question here says, our experience with the FDA so far is that they still want traditional ISO uh, 10993 biocomp tests in addition to uh, E&L tests. Can you comment? Yeah, yeah, I, I can. And uh, I, I think that my answer might not be totally, you know, satisfying to, to everyone, but I'll say that it depends, right? So uh, I think that if your device is made out of very common materials that have a long history of safe use on the, on the medical device landscape, that, uh, that it's generally not required to do both, say, the, uh, the traditional biocomp tests and the chemistry tests that those um, tests would replace. So, so it's very rare to see the FDA ask for both genotoxicity testing and chemical characterization. We see it go the other way where let's say you did genotoxicity testing and no chemistry and then when the FDA sees it they have some, some other reason to feel concerned and then they ask for chemistry. Um, but the, the only time I can see where they would specifically request both at the same time say like genotoxicity and chemistry testing together, is if they have a feeling that the device materials themselves are, are pretty novel and they might be concerned that uh, due to the limitations of chemistry testing that you know something could be missed that genotoxicity testing might still catch. And I have seen that with very novel uh, materials in devices. All right, thank you, Matt. Uh, another question here for you. We're, we're have enough time to get maybe one or two more in here. So uh, this one says, is it accepted that chemical characterization to evaluate process residuals is not as complete or extensive as materials characterization? Hi, Chris, I'm, I'm sorry. I think we missed part of that question. Would you mind uh, quickly repeating it? Sure. 
Uh, the, the question asks, is it accepted that chemical characterization to evaluate process residuals is not as complete or extensive as materials characterization? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that, that's also a great question. So in this case where we're thinking about manufacturing or processing residuals, Oftentimes, what we can do is do a more limited chemistry study that's targeted to those specific uh, residuals. So, for example, when you have, say, a device that's made out of 316 stainless steel that's been tested and retested a thousand times uh, over the, the years for biocompatibility, we, we really know that this material, 316L stainless steel, is biocompatible and it's safe. The only concern is the residuals. And we may know what those residuals might be. So they're probably machining coolants and things like that. So in that case, we can do a more limited chemistry study to address those residuals and then rely on the long history of safe use of the material to, to create an overall positive picture of biocompatibility. And uh, in my experience, this has been very often well accepted by the FDA. All right, thank you, Matt. Uh, we've got uh, another question here for you. It says, uh, can we have an idea of the cost of a full ENL plus extracted substances CC analysis? So yeah, this is Annalise. I will take this question. So of course the cost depends on the setup of your study. So either whether or not you are using two solvents or three solvents and whether or not exhaustive extraction is required. So for three solvents and exhaustive extraction, you need to think about pricing around 90 to 20,000 US dollars. All right, thank you, Annalise. Looks like we have time for just one more. We're gonna sneak one more in here right at the wire. Uh, this one says, is it possible to set uh, acceptance criteria prior to starting testing? So yes, it, it is possible to do that, provided that you know what those compounds are going to be. So we can say with, before any testing begins that if compounds come back below the threshold of toxicological concern for the respective uh, route of, of patient contact, that those uh, would be acceptable. If we have, if we're on the lookout for specific compounds so that we can in advance look up the Noels and the Lowells for that compound, we can compute a, a tolerable exposure for that and set an acceptance criteria before results come back. More often though, we don't know what compounds are going to come back, so it's very difficult to set acceptance criteria before you know what those compounds are. All right, well thank you, Matt, and thank you, Annalise, for a great Q&A session. That is all the time that we have for questions for today. If we didn't get to your question today, someone will be getting back to you after the program is over. And within the next 24 hours, you'll receive a personalized follow-up email with details and a link to today's presentation on demand. Please feel free to invite your colleagues and peers who may not have been available to listen to today's event. This webinar is copyright 2018 by UBM. The presentation materials are owned by our copyright by Nelson Laboratories, and the individual speakers are solely responsible for their content and opinions. On behalf of our guests, I'm Chris Keach. We'd like to thank you for attending today's course, and we hope that you'll join us tomorrow.